Okay, so uh, we're going to move into the next module. So this is module two. Um, and what I'm going to do here is kind of catch up to where Edmund uh, has taken us in terms of the alignment. And I'll be kind of providing a little color commentary uh, in terms of some of the, the topics and, and uh, file types and um, uh, and some of the parameters that, that Edmund had discussed. And then I'm going to catch us up and move us into to the, the actual chip seek uh, module. So the, so the max two. Um, uh, let me do that. All right. And of course. All right. So the learning objectives of this module is really, again, to uh, get into a little bit more of the conceptual details around um, what's going on in terms of the sequence alignment. Um, uh, then I'm going to define mapping quality, which is different than base quality, um, but scored on the same matrix. Uh, and then we'll go into a little bit more details on the SAM BAM file, as Edmund has already introduced. Um, and then at the end of this module, and obviously work that you've already done as part of the the, um, the tutorial, is, is being able to perform a basic BWA alignment um, and understanding the scope and purpose of some of the selected um, non-default runtime parameters. So where are we in the workflow? We're here now. We're we're getting ready to do the alignment. So, you know, what what is the issue that we're trying to solve here computationally? And it's really one of similarity searching. And and when we think about alignments, we can think about them in two main ways: either a global alignment or a, a local alignment. And so, an example of a global alignment would be something that um, tries to find the optimal alignment that includes all the characters from the sequence. Um, that you give it. So for example, Clustal, some of you might be familiar with, uh, is an example of something that provides a global alignment. Um, the objective of a local alignment um, is somewhere, uh, something that's trying to find the optimal alignment that only includes the most similar local region or regions within a particular sequence string. And so uh, that would be an, ex an example of that would be, for example, BLAST, or of course, as we're going to get into um, uh, BWA. So uh, when we think about local alignments, um, we can kind of broadly classify those into two kind of main groups. Um, one where you're, um, you're trying to provide a uh, rank solution of all possible answers or, or all possible alignments uh, of a particular sequence string um, to a, a reference, um, typically um, many references. And, and an example of that would be, you know, a blast search that you do. Say you had a sequence string and you were, you were trying to see what was the best match for, let's see, the, N, you know, the NT nucleotide database, GenBank database. You might use something like blast. Um, and another way would be if you wanted to find the optimal solution for or the best solution for the alignment. Um, so when you're searching um, many, many, many uh, sequence against one, and of course, that's the example that we're going to be working through uh, today. And, and one, one tool that we that that uh, works in this framework is, is BWA. When we talk about bow tie, we talked about star. We talked about some other uh, other algorithms that do the same thing. So when we when we work in this space, the statistics are important um, in sequence similarity searching, and we really need these statistics to discriminate the difference between real uh, and artifacts. So false uh, true positives versus false positives um, uh, in in your alignments, and um, we do this using an estimate of probability. Um, that the match might occur by chance. And in BLAST, of course, things like the recall and E values are used, um, but in short read aligners, and, and BWA being one example, uh, it reports a FRED-like mappability, prop mappability probability, as, as we'll discuss. So like anything we do in the, in the wet lab or the dry lab, you got to know your reagents. And so changing the reference that you use for your alignments um, changes the 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 space, the search space that you're using, and changes the statistics. It also, in the context of ChIP-seq, would change the coordinate structure that you're using. And so you must know the reference build that you use or the reference sequence that you use if you want to do any downstream analysis. You can't be matching um, data that you aligned using, for example, the previous uh, patch of HG38 with the newest patch, you can't use the T to T genome 
if if you uh, if you're using that uh, and and use those coordinates against um, GRC 38 because the coordinates are going to be different. And so the first thing you should ask yourself is what's the appropriate reference, um, and and then use that reference throughout your your analysis. And and obviously crossing references. Um, uh, you know, if you've got half your data aligned to one uh, version of HG38 and a half aligned to another, um, that's uh, problematic. Okay, so um, we talked a little bit about indexing, and so I'm going to kind of go through that really briefly in the next few slides, just to kind of give you a, a conceptual framework of what the heck is going on under the hood. Uh, and, and I find that can be a little bit helpful uh, as you're going through this. So we talked about this concept of indexing. Um, so really, really, this is all about um, increasing the speed of the alignment. So think about the problem here. We have a, a read, let's say it's 100 nucleotides in length, and we're trying to align it to the, to the human reference, which is 3.2 billion nucleotides uh, in length, um, you know, summing up all the chromosomes. We would start on chromosome one, position one, and see if it matched there and then move to position two, position three, position four. That would take an enormous amount of time. It would be highly accurate, but it would probably never com complete. So how can we solve this problem or how can we speed this problem up or, or speed this uh, challenge up? And so uh, the way that that's really been solved for short read aligners is generating these indices. And, and I think someone put this actually in the Slack channel can really think about it as like an index of a book. I think that's a great way to think about it. Um, and just, I made a note down here that there's this Burroughs-Wheeler transform that's used during the indexing. I'm not gonna get into that, but if you're interested in how this compression works, uh, you can follow this YouTube um, link. So here's just a super toy example, just to get your head around what we're talking about. But when we're generating a, uh, an index, so here's our reference sequence, and we just talked about chromosome 19. In, in bioinformatics, um, uh, when we count reference strings, they can either be zero-based or one-based. And so that's why I'm using zero as the first position here. Um, and you need to know whether you're zero-based or one-based, and that depends on the browser you're using. Um, but nevertheless, uh, we basically start from the end of the, of, the FAS, of the FASTA file, in this case, say the first position of chromosome 19, and if we're generating a reference into, let's say, four more, four more words, so four nucleotide length uh, strings, we can compress this reference sequence basically into a table where each of these um, formers are listed and the position in which they occur in the string is, is recorded. And you can see right away, even in this very toy example, I was able to compress um, position zero and position six, which have exactly the same sequence string um, twice. And so now, instead of looking across all uh, uh, all um, five or all six positions, I only need to look across um, uh, five positions. And of course, hopefully you can appreciate how this would scale um, if you're looking across the human genome at a short enough word length that it would be highly repetitive within the context of this of this table. So then how do we actually do the alignment? So now that we've generated our index, and this is exactly what we're doing when we do BWA index, we then take our sequence string and we extract the first five, the first um, four mer, so this is the toy example we're using, on the five prime end of the sequence read, and then we look it up in the table. And, and you can see in this toy example that, of course, that um, ATTA matches position zero or position six. So now I know that my sequence read is uh, aligned to the reference in either position zero or position six. So here we are, here it is. And so I'm either here in the, with respect to the reference or I'm here with respect to the reference. So I've done that seed matching to the index. So then the final step of, of the, of, of the seed-based extension or the seed-based aligner is to then to extend the read. So I know where I am in the reference. So I go back to my reference and I say, okay, what's the next base, the next base, the next base. And then I see when I extend my, um, my sequence where it aligns um, optimally with respect to the reference. And you can see in this toy example, um, actually it aligns to position six. And so this is the position that is uh, selected by the aligner as being the optimal solution for that that alignment. So that's kind of a toy example. Hopefully that is a little bit useful to you. Um, in, in 
you know, practically how does BWA do this? So for uh, BWA Align, which is um, the other commonly used module for shorter reads uh, in BWA, it uses a 32-mer. Um, it generates a 32-mer um, index table. Uh, for MEM, it's 22. Um, and then essentially, the we go through the same process. We take the first 32 bases of your sequence read uh, and align it to the table. Uh, and we allow for up to two mismatches in the seed region. That's just a default parameter that that's used in BWA. You can actually change that. And then the read is extended from where the seed matches to the reference to some set threshold. And we use the base qualities um, as a measure of uh, how far out to extend that read. And, and, and in the in the default, it's essentially the sum of the base mismatched base qualities that we use to decide how long to extend that read. And then the read can be truncated after that threshold is reached. So let's say, for example, we started extending and we had a, uh, uh, let's say, a read extension threshold set at 100. Um, then if we had, you know, two mismatches with a FRED score of 40, that would equal 80. But when we got to the third one that had a, you know, a FRED score of, let's say, another 40, that would extend the threshold and the read extension would be truncated at that position. Um, there are two types of truncation that are included in BAM files, either soft clipped or hard clipped. Soft clip just means it's clipped um, uh, uh, conceptually in the, in, the, in the file and it's actually just lower cased. Um, but hard clip means that the sequence string is actually removed. That's fairly, un, un, it's not usually typical. Uh, most, most typically uh, the reads are soft clipped. Okay, and then once that's done, the read is assigned a mapping quality. And so what is a mapping quality? Um, again, it's very similar to a base quality, except it's with respect to how confident the aligner is that the read is mapped in the correct place. Um, so it's the probability that the read is mis mis misplaced in the genome. So, uh, you know, I place a read with a mapping quality of 20. One times out of 100, that read is going to be misplaced, um, mapping quality 30, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the mapping qualities themselves are derived from the base qualities and the number and frequencies of mismatches for the best alignment all of, versus all other possible alignments. So you can imagine if I align a read into a particular position in the genome, there may be another position in the genome um, where the read can also align, but it's got another mismatch, but the base quality of that mismatch is slightly lower. So then it's going to rank um, uh, the one with the slightly lower um, uh, a base score as the potentially the or, or with the higher mapping quality. Um, and again, they're they're reported on our Fred scale. Here's the uh, the um, primary uh, literature that uh, discusses how uh, these are computed in more detail. So what's important to know is, um, and probably the most use of mapping qualities is with respect to repetitive alignments. So as you probably know, um, the majority of your genome is actually a repetitive sequence. Um, and that repetitive sequence causes challenges when we do alignments, because if we have a read that aligns to, uh, that, that can align to two places in the genome that have identical sequences for the length of that sequence string, what do we do with that? So how do we handle that? Those essentially get assigned a mapping quality of zero. So in the BAM file, they'll have an MQ value of zero, uh, and typically we would then filter um, to remove these repetitive sequences. Um, and typically that's done when we uh, filter using the bit flags, as Edmund had just discussed, um, to remove uh, sequence reads that are multi-mapped multi um, uh, in the genome. Although there are other uh, strategies that you can use in some cases um, the the um, randomly or the multi-mapped reads will be uh, assigned a one position on the genome randomly, um, and then that can be included in the downstream applications. But in most cases, we strip out um, these multi-mapped reads. Okay, so I've seen I've shown you this before: sequence fast Q, BWA plus reference output is your SAM file. Um, you guys already been introduced to BWA, but if you're interested, this is the primary paper and the manual is, uh, and the GitHub repo is listed there. 
Um, as Edmund introduced, there are two main modules, um, Align and MEM. Align is for reads shorter than 75 nucleotides. And when I first started in ShipSeq, that was the vast majority of data that we generated. Actually, all the data that we generated was less than 75. But over the last um, you know, five to six years, that's really changed now, um, where the vast majority of data is greater than 75. And so MEM has is, is really become the default. Um, and the difference between a, a line and mem, as I introduced, is really just differences in the seed length and then details on how the gaps are handled in the alignment. And again, if you're interested in understanding the gaps, how the gaps are handled, um, I would uh, refer you to uh, to the manual. Um, and just to add, though, that um, indels in, in short reads are notoriously difficult to deal with. Um, and uh, uh, are still problematic today. And then there's also this other module that's used for <clears throat> much longer reads, although I've I've never actually used it. So in terms of how the alignment is run, and again, you've been introduced this, so I'm just going to go through this really quickly. The first step is to index your your reference. So that's that's shown here. Um, sorry, I should put this on. So that's shown here. So BWA index uh, your reference sequence, and this is a FASTA file. This FASTA file can contain one chromosome, so basically the greater than sign and the name of the chromosome, um, or it contain uh, 10 chromosomes or 20 chromosomes or 23 or 24 chromosomes or, or however you want. Um, it can contain as many entries as you want. Um, and then the second step is then to use um, your, your index uh, and, uh, uh, and then uh, give it your reads, in this case, your, your paired end reads, read one and read two remembering that these two files need to be um, read names sorted uh, for BWA to work with them. And then it would output then a SAM file or BAM file, depending on the parameters, that, the runtime parameters that you use. One thing to keep in mind, and I can't remember where the admin had said this, but you, it, will, it needs to know only the path to the reference FASTA file that you use to generate the index. And, it, and the reference FASTA file must be in the same directory as all the indexed um, output files. So when you ran the index command, you would have done it inside a directory. And then when you point BWA to it, you point it to that original FASTA file, but that FASTA file must sit within the directory that all of the index files are in for it to run. Otherwise, it'll throw an error. Oh, and here's the manual for you. OK, so we've done that. Don't need to go through that again. Um, uh, Edmund talked about reference genomes. Again, here's two sources of reference genomes. We use the uh, the um, UCSC uh, uh, browser reference genomes. Um, the other major source is the NCBI. And I just want to briefly go through that just to introduce one other concept. So there's many reference genomes av available at the NCBI. You can use the genome function and search for, for example, Homo sapiens, and it'll take you to a page that looks like this or similar. Um, you can select your reference genome, and this is GRC38 patch 14, which is likely to be, or I believe is to be, the last linear representation uh, of, of the uh, original uh, reference human genome. Obviously, this is being, um, we're now transitioning to a new world <laughs> that we're not going to talk about today, where we move from linear representations of genomes to graph-based representation of genomes. This is really work that's been pioneered by, for example, the TTT consortium in, in collaboration and, and working closely with the HPRC, so the Human Pan Genome Reference Consortium. And I imagine that in the next five years, we will be transitioning possibly to, uh, to these um, graph-based representations as opposed to linear, uh, and that will be a topic of a workshop, I'm sure, in the future. So you can go to that link, and it will take you to the... Uh, to the um, uh, to the main page, um, it'll give you uh, accessions for the for the assemblies, and then you can go and look on the FTP. And this gives you a list of of the various file types. What I like about NCBI is it also gives you all of the annotation files, so the G GFF files, which are basically gene or whatever coordinate or protein or whatever um, that you're interested in on the same genome build. Obviously, the gene annotations are also specific for a particular build, so you need to make sure whatever resources you're using are aligned with the genome that you're working with. And again, you know, here's the, the FASTA file for the entire genome now, so this is all the chromosomes um, that you would be working with, and you can just download this one file. It's about a gig in, in, in size. 
and then go through that BWA index process. Um, and then you would generate an index for the entire genome. It's, it's that simple. So exactly the same as we did for chromosome 19, but now for the entire genome. And then um, I like to point the whole re one of the reasons I went through this is to point this out, which is something that you might not be familiar with, which is an MD5 checksum. So what is an MD5 checksum? So this is a way of uniquely um, uh, identifying or, or generating a digital fingerprint for your file type. So I can't tell you how many times I've downloaded a reference or, or, or some data set from the internet and uh, you know I've had my pipe or I've had the, the connection drop and uh, not all of the file has been downloaded. Uh, and there's no error thrown, it's just there on my file system. But for example, the file is truncated, it's missing some part or, or, or what have you. Um, how, do you, how can you check for that? These files are huge. Sometimes it takes a long time to do the download. Well, MD5 checksums find, um, provide, provide one mechanism to do it. Edmund introduced others. You know, there's, you know, obviously looking at the file size and things like that is also important. But MD5 checksum, which is, is in, your, in your bash shell, you can just run it. You do MD5, um, you run the command MD5, um, give it the, the name of the file you downloaded, and it will compute a uh, alphanumeric string. And then you can look at that same file, this file here, which basically has a list of all these uh, checksums, and you just check to see that your string matches the string that's there, and that tells you the file is identical. Note, if you decompress the file, the checksum will be different, so it has to be in the compressed format um, to match the checksum that's presented there. So very useful tool, um, and one I would highly recommend you get to understand. Okay. So once we've downloaded our, our reference and we've indexed our reference, then we align our reads. Again, you guys know this now more. Uh, you, you know this through going through Edmund's um, uh, uh, tutorial. I did want to just take a brief minute to talk about how read one and read two are actually leveraged in, uh, in, in short read alignment. I've kind of gone over the algorithm for you. But just so that you understand, uh, BWA aligns each of the reads independently. Um, and following alignment, it then pairs the reads. Um, so how do we actually use the read pairs in any way that's going to be useful? Uh, and so that's shown here. Um, and I apologize for the pencils. The pencils are from my class. <laughs> I put there for students to, for slides that they need to understand. But, and I think they've kind of bled over into this presentation, so you can just ignore the pencils. Um, but essentially, the issue is this. Um, you can have an example where read one, so one read of the pair, aligns to a, re a repeat in the reference that's present in two different places, OK? So at this point, if we had no other information, we would have to flag that read one as a mapping quality 0, because it's multi-mapped, and remove that or, or, or filter it from downstream analysis. But however, if we have the read two alignment, so the mate or the pair for that read, and that read two aligns to a unique place in the genome that is within some specified distance of read one, and this is typically the mean insert length of the library that you're um, that you that you've sequenced. Um, I, I think plus one standard deviation. I can't remember exactly, um, but if it's in within that specified distance then read the alignment for read one can be rescued because now we know that read one is actually in this repeat and not this repeat. Um, and so we're able to rescue this alignment and that gives us a little bit of a window into uh, alignments into repeats. And, and Guillaume and many others have leveraged this kind of uh, this feature to be able to ask questions about epigenetic states of uh, repeat regions where all we have is short read data because it allows us to then ask questions about what's going on here uh, with read two, uh, read one with respect to that read. And overall, is it, is, it, is it a big improvement in terms of alignment? It's a little bit. Uh, you're able to rescue about 2% of, of reads um, at 75 nucleotides in length by using this read pairing strategy. Okay, so you've seen this to death and I'll just show that again. So now that we've done our alignment, We've generated the SAM file. What is a SAM file? Again, Edmund gave you an introduction. I'm going to go through a little bit more detail just to give you a little bit better understanding. SAM file stands for Sequence Alignment Map File, and it's basically a generic format 
um, that almost all short read aligners or maybe all short read aligners output. And this is a great standardization that has developed uh, within the uh, genomics community over the, over the last 10 years um, that allows us to work together and to, allows tools to, to, uh, to work interoperatively uh, on the output of the alignments. Um, details of what it is are here. Um, this is the uh, primary um, uh, publication that first described the, the SAM format. Um, and then the authors uh, uh, who who uh, drove that uh, drove that process forward. So this is what it looks like. You've you've already kind of been uh, you, you've kind of been introduced to this. Um, but if you did open up your your SAM file, you would see a bunch of stuff that looks like this. So how do we break this down? It's basically a you know a column delimited file um, where each of the columns have a specific um, uh, have have specific uh, feature associated to them, and and in case that's not already clear to you, a BAM file is identical to a SAM file. It's just the binary format of the SAM file. So instead of storing it as a text file, we store it as binary values because it's that's how a computer thinks, and it doesn't mean and it means that we don't have to interconvert from text to binary, do some computation, and then go back from binary to text. So, so by keeping it in a binary format, A, it's smaller, and B, it's the way the, the way your CPU thinks. So it, it just saves time and, and space. So it's a good thing to do. But it means you can't read it because it's binary, not text. So you need to convert it back to a text using SAM tools or Picard or whatever you're using to be able to read it again uh, in your in your shell in your bash shell. So if you just try to open a BAM file, it's just going to give you a bunch of uh, gibberish um, and you have to use a tool to convert it back to text if that's not clear already. So um, uh, Edmund introduced the header file um, and I can't tell you how many times when we provide data to, to collaborators, they ask me what genome build uh, the, the data was aligned to. And of course, that information is in the header. So the header is a super useful um, component of the BAM file, and you, you should get familiar with your header. So when you get a file, let's say you had a BAM file, take a look at the header because the header has the information. For example, what reference was used, um, you know, what the reference length was. Um, uh, can be an MD5 checksum in there. Um, it will give you information in terms of what program was run, whether it's been dupe marks, what kind of sorted was used, and those kinds of things. So the header can be uh, can be very uh, very useful. Um, careful word of caution: if you just use SAM tools view, for example, it'll strip the header off. So if you if you do SAM tools view and then write it to a new file, you'll have a, a new SAM file without a header, and that won't be good because it will then choke uh, 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 downstream applications uh, could could choke on it. So you have to make sure that when you're when you're viewing and moving your files around that you keep, the, or when you're viewing your files and doing some kind of manipulation that you keep the header intact. Okay, so here are the columns, the 11 columns. I'm just gonna briefly go through them just so you can understand them. Uh, and, and I would encourage you to do this in, in the BAM files that you've generated is uh, for, you know, just open up one of the BAM files input or K27 acetylation and take a look yourself and try to get your head around what it is you're looking at. So you know the the first um, the first column here is is basically a string that gives you the, the the query name. So this is what is this name here? This is the same name that I showed you in the um, in the fastq file, right? So again, you've got your tile, your lane, your tile, your x, your y coordinate, and we know these two reads in the red box are paired because they have the same x, y coordinate, right? So those are or those are are paired. And in the output, the primary output of, um, of uh, BWA, the reads will be paired um, uh, because that's how it comes through, through, the, through, the, uh, through the alignment process. The read pairing happens at the end. Um, but of course, this will not be true if you coordinate sort it because you can have read pairs that span each other. And so they'll no longer be paired in the way that they are um, straight out of BWA. And here's another example of a read pair. This next uh, column is a super useful column. Um, this is the bit, bitwise flag that, um, uh, that Edmund introduced and is used um, quite um, uh, extensively um, for filtering, uh, for generating uh, subsets of data from, your, from, your, um, from the BAM file. 
And essentially it's computed um, using uh, a sum of the bits and the bits each have meaning. Um, so here is a, 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 the, the, the breakdown of what the bits are. Um, so, and I think there was a little bit of discussion in the Slack channel about this, but this just sort of gives you the, the full description of, of how these things are generated. And just if you're interested, you know, this is actually how it's computed. So, um, you know, for uh, a flag of 83, it's basically one for that it's read pair, read mapped in a proper pair, two, 16, 64, that adds up to 83, and that's where the 83 comes from. Um, and similarly, the 163 is, is summed up. So it's basically just summing up these values uh, for each of the bit flags. And then these can be used uh, in a variety of different ways uh, to sort the reads. So that's what I'm saying here. And I think Edmund has already introduced it to you. So you can, for example, you know, here's a bit flag you can use 3844 to, to filter out this set of reads, right? So chastity failed reads, which we didn't talk about, but that's essentially a quality filtering that was used on, uh, on sequencers prior to uh, uh, the ordered arrays that are used now, where chastity filtering is not really a big thing, but it used to be uh, a big problem. On, uh, on older systems, it's just very briefly, uh, it, it filters out polyclonal clusters. So clusters that are nucleated from two, two different DNA sequence strands that generates a polyclonal cluster. And when the sequencer reads it, um, it, it obviously is problematic because it's actually derived from two independent sequence strings. Um, and there was a, something called chastity that was developed to filter those out. You might see those in some of the data that you download from, uh, from the SRA, for example, and, and that's what it is. And, and typically those are filtered out. Um, and so you can use these to filter out reads. Uh, it, makes, it gives you a, a quick way to do it. Um, what else do I want to say? Uh, I think, um, again, Edmund talked about secondary alignments. Um, so you can set the parameters in BWA to store more than one secondary alignment. So you can store 10 or all of the secondary alignments if you're interested in your BAM file. So then for each you know, individual read or for each of the FASTQ entries that had multiple, let's say it was aligned 100 times in 100 different places with the same uh, you know, uh, well, it aligned with the same at 100% um, uh, alignment in 100 different places, there would be that read would be represented 100 times in your map in your um, BAM file. And it would have a secondary alignment flag. And then supplementary, supplementary alignments, which are a little bit more tricky, but basically, um, where non overlapping parts of the sequence align to multiple locations. So those are just some of the additional flags that are uh, that can be um, handled by the bit flag. So the next column um, essentially uh, provides uh, the reference sequence name. In this particular case, it's a bit redundant, but um, it's there. Um, and then the position um, with, res oh, with respect to that reference. So that would be, let's say, for example, chromosome one and the position on chromosome one. And then the next column is the mapping quality. So this is 29, 29, 37. So, you know, one in, what is that? One in 10,000, roughly. Um, and then here's, you can see an example of a mapping quality zero. So here's an example of a read that, given its string, which you can see is a bunch of ends here, um, is, uh, was unable to be uniquely aligned to the genome, and it's given a mapping quality of zero. So that's just a, a, a toy example of, of that. Um, the next column is the so-called cigar string. You may have heard of that. The cigar string is not particularly useful for chip seek, but just as an FYI, this um, is used to encode information about the sequence alignment segment. Um, so the descriptor is here. So it's basically telling you how many nucleotides of your sequence string align to the reference genome. In this case, this was an Illumina sequencing run that was 250 base pairs in length. And this is telling you that all 250 base pairs of that read um, matched with the reference. Uh, here's one that's a little bit more um, uh, tricky. So there's four substitutions, 202 matches, and then 44 substitutions on the end. So the beginning, um, uh, the beginning didn't, uh, sorry, the beginning was soft clipped, uh, the 222 was matched, and then the 44 at the end was soft clipped. Um, and, and that was, um, uh, you know, uh, how that information is stored in the cigar string. And again, here's one that shows 250 matches. 
what, what is this, how does this actually compute it? Again, this is a good toy example just to get your head around what's going on. You've got your reference sequence, you've got your read, um, the reference is aligned or the read is aligned to the reference. And in this particular case, um, there's an insertion and a deletion. And so the, 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 the cigar string uh, that results from this alignment is 33 uh, matches, the A's, T, and the T, uh, an insertion with respect to the reference, um, three alignments, a deletion with respect to the reference, and then five uh, matches. So it's just kind of a toy example of, of, of how that information is stored. Typically for ChIP-seq, you wouldn't use that, um, but, it, but it can be use, useful in, in other strategies. Um, following that, uh, you, you, the next column, and for some reason this box is really big, um, but the next column basically gives you the position of the, um, of the alignment of the mat, of the mate, so the pair. And so you can see how this is, if you look across here diagonally, you can see that this is the same as this, as it should be, because these reads are paired. This value is the same as that value, because these reads are paired. Um, and then the next column, which is the observed template length, is a value that's used uh, downstream. And this gives you uh, an estimate or it gives you a, the, the length of the alignment with respect to the reference. And I'll just talk about that really briefly. I did want to point out this one where you can see that the read, although they're mated, the second read didn't align to the genome, was given a mapping quality of zero. Um, and so... Um, uh, and so, the, although this read aligned to a, a, a position, and so actually that that position of the one read of the pair that aligned is given to both, which is uh, how how BWA handles that. So what what are these what is these values negative five thirty two and positive five thirty two? Well, it's calculated like this. So one of the features of BWA or of the SAM file that you should be aware of is that it stores the leftmost position of the read. So that's this position of the read. And I'm not saying the five prime or the three prime because it's the leftmost with respect to the, the reference that you're using. So let's say this is our reference. This is position one. The, the position we store in the SAM file is the lowest position. Um, uh, and so that's on the five prime end of this read and on the three prime end of, of this other read, but it obviously depends on what strand you're on. And so um, we so to compute the total length of the insert, um, you, you can see that it's the, the, the leftmost position here, plus this leftmost position, plus whatever the match is, in this particular case, 250, right? Because um, it's matched uh, 250. So we, we just uh, add 250 to 484, 41143. Uh, and then uh, subtract those two positions to get the, the um, observed template length, which is the length of the DNA fragment in ChIP-seq that was associated to whatever protein it is you're immunoprecipitating, let's say, associated to a particular nucleosomes. Okay, so that was uh, essentially uh, what I wanted to go through. Obviously, the other two columns is the sequence itself. Um, and then you can see the mapping quality. And then there are some uh, additional fields uh, that are shown here that you, if you're interested in, and again, I would, I would take a look at the, at the manual, but there are, there are other optional fields where additional information with respect to the alignment can be stored. Uh, right. Okay, so um, now, we're, now that we've got a better understanding of the, um, of, the, uh, of the alignment process, what a map, what a, uh, SAM file is, what a BAM file is, we're going to go through uh, the ChIP-seq analysis workflow. Okay, so we're here in the workflow. We've we've got our sorted BAM file um, that, um, that Edmund went through, and now we're going to go into MAX2, and we're going to generate files, um, so-called bed files or bed graph files. Uh, so this is the sort of last file type, new file type that you'll be introduced as part of this module, and this is how we store that information that allows us to visualize it or to do some differential analysis as Edmund will be talking about in module three. Why do we use Max? Max is a, it works. Uh, it's um, highly, um, it's been highly used in the community, was developed as part of the ENCODE consortium by Shirley's group and Wei Li. 
Um, and um, it's, you know, last I checked, it had over 8,000 citations. It really has become a default. There is a newer version, I think Max 3, which I haven't really played with. Uh, most of the work we do is still in Max 2. Um, and that's the uh, the peak calling module that's within the IHEC uh, consortium container as well, um, developed by by the ENCODE, ENCODE, uh, ENCODE group and ENCODE uses Max as well for the majority of their peak calls. Okay, so how does Max work? So again, what is the objective? Uh, the objective of this experiment is to identify regions of enrichment um, in your IP um, comparing to uh, control. And, and, the, and the, IP, the IP is, we, we in the nomenclature of Max, we call the IP the treatment, and we call the input uh, the control. And recall that the input is typically... Uh, the the material that you sheared prior to subjecting it to immunoprecipitation. So you're doing your experiment. Let's say you used MNAs to chew up the genome. You would take a little aliquot of that MNAs digested material and you'd build a library out of it. And that would become your input. And you'd take the rest of it and you would do an IP uh, and that would become your treatment. Okay, so I'm going to go through the steps as it works. So um, when you provide it with a BAM file, um, it will look, scan across and look for significantly enriched bins, bins and it uses uh, the, the bin size that it searches. So a bin is simply a, a region of the genome, can be anything, like a, a bin could be 100 base pairs or 200 base pairs or 1,000 base pairs. We call those bins, and uh, it can be an arbitrary size. In this particular case, it's two times the average fragment size. How does it compute fragment size? it uses the observed template length that we just talked about. So it uses this value here um, to generate a, an average fragment size. And then it um, looks for bins where the number of reads counted within that bin, and this is for your treatment, is um, uh, M fold higher than, than the random genome average. So basically then taking those same reads and, and, and scattering them randomly in the genome. It takes a thousand of those of, of these randomly chosen enriched bins, and it uses that to uh, calculate the difference. As I'm going to go through in the next slide, so don't. So I, I will explain this in a little bit more detail. The distribution of the reads on the negative strand and the positive strand, um, and from that it computes something it calls d, and then it uses that d value to shift all the reads depending on what strand you're on. So on the positive um, strand. And on the negative strand, um, uh, it subtracts by D over two, okay? And I'll explain that in just a minute. And then it scales the control experiment to the same number of reads as the treatment. And this is important because you can imagine that if you're using your control experiment to, um, to estimate background, um, if your control experiment is sequenced much, 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 much deeper, let's say it's sequence 30x coverage, but your, your treatment is, is only 10x, then there's going to be nothing that's going to look enriched because everything is going to be less than, or the vast majority is going to be less than, except maybe blacklisted regions, <laughs> less than your control. So your control must be downsampled um, to, the same, uh, to the same number of reads as the treatment. But there's no way to inflate your control. Um, and so that's why it's important that your control is sequenced to at least the the same depth as your treatment is um, for max two uh, for the max two algorithm to work appropriately. If you give it a control that has much less, you know, that has been sequenced to uh, to uh, to a, 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 a much less number of reads, is that the right? I don't know. To to a reduced number of reads, that's going to underestimate the background, and it's going to give it's going to arise in in, in much much more false positives for the reasons that I'll show you in just a minute. Okay, so what's all this repositioning nonsense? Well, it's really to take uh, take account this effect, which is we have our protein DNA that we're, you know, protein DNA interaction that we're, that we're interested in assaying, let's say in, in epigenetic space, this is H3K4 trimethylation. Um, and when we shear our genome, um, and then we add our adapters, we, we have an orientation of those reads with respect to, uh, to, the, um, to the DNA in which they uh, were, were generated from. So um, because, we can, because this orientation is retained, like when we sequence from this end and when we sequence from this end, we're on different strands of the DNA, 
um, we, we get a set of reads um, from the random shearing that occurs on one side or that occurs on the other side um, with an orientation associated to it, right? And so that's kind of looked here. So if you look at a density plot of where those reads align, you get a bunch of reads on one side, you get a bunch of reads on the other side, and then you don't get any reads in the middle because of course this is sterically occluded or blocked by the presence of whatever protein and in our case, the nucleosome DNA wrap, which obviously is not an area that's gonna be um, subjected to, uh, to either tagging or digestion or what have you. <clears throat> you can plot the distribution of, of these peaks um, of, of, the, of, the, of these uh, distributions. Uh, so you, you, you shown here, and then you can compute the distance between um, the, the, the peak on one strand and the peak on the other strand. And this gives you D in this case, uh, I can barely read this, but I think it says D. I'm reading on a very small laptop. D, D equals one over 126 or 120. I can't quite read that. And that's, that's the shift value. That's the D value that's used to shift all the reads such that the reads then become uh, positioned uh, where the the um, at the center of the protein DNA interaction. Okay, so once we calculated D um, and we've done our shifting, we then uh, actually go into the peak calling. And for the peak calling, we have to make an assumption um, because we need to assign a statistical confidence to our enrichment. And that assumption is that the reads follow a Poisson or a normal distribution. Okay, so we assume that that's a Poisson distribution for the read count distri uh, distribution. Um, this is true in Max2. Um, obviously, you're probably familiar with other, um, other tools that use different distributions. Um, uh, and uh, we can certainly have a discussion about that. Max2 uses Poisson, and, and I'll get into why that is in a minute. So you essentially then break the genome into two times D bins. So you've got D. So in this case, if, if D was, you know, let's say 125, then you'd be searching the genome in 250 base pair bins. Uh, and then for each bin, you calculate the mean number of sequences. So the mean number of sequence reads, so you, you're looking at those, those um, uh, read starts from your IP, in this case, treatment um, that align within it. Um, and so that's basically the number of reads divided by the length of the bin and nucleotides. That gives you the mean number of reads for that bin. And then you calculate the mean number of reads um, for, um, I don't know, I got mean written here. Calculate the mean number of sequence reads. You can ignore the second mean number there uh, for your input. And this is your control. And you do it for the bin that you're looking at, plus the next 1KB, 5KB, and 10KB bin. And those are fixed bin sizes. They're not dependent upon on D. And essentially what you're trying to do is you're trying to see where, if, are there regions near where the bin is that you're looking at where you have a lot of input signal? Or where is the maximum input signal um, that you have in these larger bins? Remembering this is a mean. So the length is so the the number of reads that align within those bin sizes is going to divide it by the length of the of the of the bin. So you're not going to get really inflated values. It's going to be the mean, um, and it gives you a way of sampling across across that space. And the maximum value in either the bin that you're looking at or the one kb, five kb, or ten kb bin um, is uh, becomes your Poisson lambda value. Okay. And that's the one parameter that you need to compute a Poisson distribution, as I'll talk about in just a minute. So the control mean becomes the Poisson lambda for that bin. So then using the Poisson distribution for lambda, you calculate the p-value for your IP mean. And then, of course, because we are doing many, many tests across the genome, in fact, hundreds of thousands of tests, we need to do a, a correction for multiple testing uh, using a Benjamin Hosh. And then in, in the case of MAX2, it uses Benjamin Hoshberg correction. So what the heck am I talking about? What is Lambda? What is all this stuff? Um, so um, the, I, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with, with distributions. Poisson distribution is one type of distribution where um, the only parameter you need to know to compute a Poisson distribution is Lambda. Um, uh, and uh, from that, you can uh, you can you can compute a distribution for for that particular uh, uh, for, for that particular bin. So how do we use that? So essentially, uh, let's assume that we had a uh, a bin where your treatment bin said had a mean number of sixteen reads. 
uh, aligned within it. Um, and then you had a control bin where you had, let's say, a mean number, uh, a lambda value of 10. So the mean number of reads aligned within control bin was 10. So you would take that lambda 10, you would plot your distribution, and then you would take your treatment bin, you would see where it intersected with, um, with lambda. And then from that, of course, um, you can calculate the significance of that um, enrichment. And that's it. So that's how we're assigning p-values to each of the um, uh, each of the enriched bins in the genome. Of course, we need to ensure that we correct, as I just said, for multiple testing. Um, and in the context of uh, MAX2, we use Benjamin Hoshberg, which is essentially, uh, you know, we uses a rank-based strategy. So it ranks the p-values and then, um, uh, and then uh, adjusts for the number of tests that are done in that particular experiment. And you must, you, and of course, the output of that is a Q value or an FDR value. And when you're doing any work downstream with MAX2, you should always be using the Q value, not the P value, um, if you want to assign significance. And by default, the, the, the threshold for MAX2 in terms of reporting is 0 0.05 um, uh, FDR or 0 0.05 Q value. Okay. So what, what does MAX2 require to actually run? And again, you're going to go through this um, eight minutes. You're going to go through this with Edmund, so I don't need to spend a lot of time on this, but um, you, you are going to, uh, well, the minimum it requires is, is the IP. Um, so uh, that would be um, uh, a, um, uh, in, in the context of ChipSeq, that would be your IP. Remember that for a tax seek, we don't have an input, so we we run it in, uh, we run it with just the the uh, treatment alone or just the attack seek alone. Um, it, the treatment file is the only required parameters. I say here, um, the fam the file can be either a BAM file, which is what you're going to be using for chip seek, or it can be a bed format. And I'm going to talk about what a bed format is in just a minute. Um, and that's what you would use, uh, or that's what's used in, in the ENCODE pipeline for a TACSEQ because of the uh, adjustment for the TN5 uh, digestion that I talked about in module one. Um, yeah, and I think that's it. And the other thing you need to know is the effective genome sizes, although I think MAX2 has those um, pre-computed as well. So you just have to tell it what genome you're using. Um, there are seven major functions in MAX2. We're only going to be covering call peak um, in this lecture. If you're interested in learning about some of the other functions, um, you can uh, issue uh, the dash H command and it'll give you the full list of functions. Call peak is the main function in MAX2 and you call it like this. Um, this should be secondhand nature to all of you now. So this is on command line, MAX2 call peak. Um, and it's going to give you uh, the set of, of options. Um, and I'm just going to focus on a few of the most commonly used options in the next series of slides. But you can see, for example, you can set your own Q value. You could set your own P value if you wanted to. You can force um, the, uh, the extension size of your reads. Um, you can force the, uh, the bin sizes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, in terms of the input file options, uh, dash T uh, basically um, uh, is the um, option that you use to specify the input data file. Again, the only required parameter, dash C, um, and then you point it to the path of the control um, as, as Edmund will go through. Um, dash F tells it the format of the input file, um, but you don't need to, to do this. It will decide automatically based on the extension. Um, and then dash G is the, the mappable genome size, as I just talked about. And I think you can specify the genome build uh, and it will, uh, it automatic, it, it has the effective genome size um, uh, pre-stored. And just to be clear, the effective genome size is, is the amount of the genome that's alignable um, uh, in, in that particular uh, genome uh, build. And so you may, you may or may not know, but for example, for HG, HG38, there's about you know 200 million bases that are annotated as NNNNN in the genome, and so you know the effective genome size is obviously much lower than that. Okay, what are the output arguments? You need to tell it where you're going to put it. Um, you can add a pre pre prefix for the output file so that you can control your file naming, um, and then uh, you know a, a most commonly used parameter is 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 dash capital B or or double dash um, BDG does the same thing. Basically, that stores the fragment pileup for the control lambda. 
um, and then uh, 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 computes and stores the, the log 10 p values and uh, negative log 10 q values in, um, uh, in the bed graph files, as I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, peak calling arguments, again, the, the default is 0 0.05, but you can adjust that. You can also adjust the, the p value. Um, and then as, um, as Edmund will talk about, the other major argument that's probably worth knowing is broad. So by default, uh, Max will run as a narrow in the narrow peak mode, um, and narrow peak mode works well for uh, for for punctate marks like K27 acylation, K4 trimethylation, for, but for marks that occupy larger um, uh, spaces in the genome or larger contiguous um, segments in the genome, um, this can be problematic because it will break. Um, the max, the way the max two peak caller works, as you can see, it scans across with bins. And so sometimes you can get regions where, let's say you had a mega base marked by K27 trimethylation, but there was a dip in alignment because let's say there was a re repeat sequence there, or for whatever reason, you know, there was less reads accumulated in that position. And so as max, uh, you know, looked at that bin in that region, it said, okay, well, that region's not significant, so it doesn't call it. So you can get these kind of chunky blocks of peaks within these large segments, which you actually know based on the biology and how the mark is, uh, you know, propagated in the genome, that that's actually a contiguously marked um, region. And so the broad mark essentially calls the peaks using a, um, uh, using a narrow peak strategy, using the binning strategy I just talked about, and then stitches the peaks together um, based on some parameters. So for example, if the peaks are within some distance of one another, it will stitch those two together and call that entire segment as enriched and assign it that Q value um, uh, for that entire segment. So that's, you know, at a very high level, the difference between narrow and broad. Broad is never, I mean, I wouldn't say it's an opt, it's not a perfect solution to the problem because there, there are lots of nuances in how the stitching is done. Um, and so again, you know, you know, I, th I think it's something you need to to get familiar with, whether you're, you know, whether you want to run your um, your analysis in broad or or narrow mode. I know that uh, Edmund will go through both uh, in, in the tutorial. So you'll get a you'll get a feel for for how how these are how these are done. Typically for K27 trimethylation, uh, we do do uh, broad mode um, as, as is indicated in, in the um, uh, in as, as we'll do so in the tutorial. Okay, so what are what are the outputs of uh, Max two? So you get a series of files, and um, I've highlighted some of here. Um, you'll get a bed file of the peak. So these are the re <laughs> the regions of enrichment. You'll get a a tab file or tabular file of the peaks, and I'll, so basically just a column delimited file. And then you'll get two bed graph files, which are similar to the bed file, as I'll talk about. One for treatment, and one for the control lambda. Um, uh, and then you'll get uh, bed files for the broad peaks uh, or uh, gap peaks, depending on um, the type of region that you're doing, uh, uh, depending on the type of uh, whether you've done broad or narrow um, reached, uh, broad or narrow mode. So, so what do these things look like? And again, I'm going to go through what a bed file is uh, specifically in a few slides. Um, but essentially, you, you can think about it right now as just a column delimited file where you have um, the, the, the chromosome or the contig that you're aligning to. If this was, you know, a single chromosome, you would have that. But um, so chromosome one um, and then the start and end position for the particular feature. Uh, so this is the enriched bin in this particular case. Um, and then a, uh, you know, the name of the peak, some... Um, uh, the, basically an integer of the of the score for that peak um, that's displayed in, for example, the UCSC genome browser, um, and then the statistics for um, how confident MAX2 is in that particular region. So this includes fold change over control, um, and then the log 10 p-value and log 10 q-value. Of course, you'd most often want to be looking at the log 10 q-value for any kind of um, analysis. And then the final column is the relative summit position um, from the peak start. So basically, where is the, the summit of the peak um, compared to um, uh, where the peak starts, where the peak starts. So that would be 8,000 and, you know, 840,000 and 81 plus 158. That would give you the, the maximum peak height for that particular feature. Um, you also get a, a, 
a tab file so that just looks like this. Again, it's a column delimited file with a, a few uh, less features. And this allows you, you know, you can load this in R or in Excel or whatever you're looking for or whatever tool you're, you're using that allows you to sort um, for uh, various things. And you can see in this particular case, um, the only um, the only value that's stored is the is the negative log 10 Q value. Um, what else is there? Um, you'll also get bed graph files um, as if you specify the, the dash B option. And I'll talk about what bed graph files are in just a minute. Um, and this will give you the uh, essentially the, the treatment. So your IP pileup bed graph file, your control lambda bed graph file, um, and then also a Q value bed graph file. And, and these are the file types that you can use to then do visualization as, as we'll talk about in, in the tutorial. Um, so, you know, ChipSeq is typically analyzed. Uh, well, once we've run through Max2, uh, we generate bed files and bed graph files, which become the, 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 the file types that we do downstream analysis with. Um, there's a variety of different tools you can use, IGV being one of them that you can run locally. Um, you can also load these onto public browsers like the UCSC genome browser um, uh, uh, to, to visualize the files. Um, bed, bed graph file, bed stands for browser extensional um, data format is again, it's just a column delimited file. Um, the minimum um, number of columns is three, which is essentially a chromosome, um, a chromosome, chromosome start and end position. Um, one thing to note that in the bed file, the um, position is uh, is half open. Um, and that simply re refers to, I think it's, is it half open? I'm pretty sure it's half open. I can't even read that right now. Uh, that refers to how, uh, what coordinates are sorted or stored in the bed file. So you can imagine that you could store both the start and end position, or you could store um, the uh, the position next to the starter end, or you could, you could store the, um, uh, just the start position and not the end position. And that's just, you know, it's just a convention. It could be any of them. Um, and half open is a convention that's used. So essentially the bed graph file is very similar, except that we have the chromosome start and end position, and then we add a data value. And this can be a Q value, for example, um, for that particular position. Um, there's also uh, at the header of these files, uh, we, we can include a track definition line. Um, the track definition line looks like this and essentially just provides information if you're using a genome browser or, for example, the height, how you want to scale it, the color, all of that can be encoded within the, the header file of, of the bed graph file. Um, you can then convert these bed graph files into binary versions, so binary index versions in the same way that we did for the BAM for the, um, uh, for the uh, reference file, so we converted it from a FASTA file into a binary indexed version of that FASTA file. Um, and that just allows for browsers or whatever tool you're using to visualize the, the bed graph file, allows it to, in, to um, operate um, much more efficiently, reduces space, um, and allows it to, to navigate through. And that's my last slide. All right. So